Well, for the last couple of months, we've been studying the character of God, his attributes, learning more about who God is. Well, tonight we're going to go just to what I really put into the category of God's character. God's character in terms of what we refer to in the modern church as the Trinity. And we're going to talk about not only where the concept of the Trinity originated, the term Trinity itself, and some scriptures that will explain what the Trinity is, some historical truths about what the Trinity is not, and then some Old and New Testament scriptures that talk about the triune God, or what I call God's three-person nature. Um, one thing that before we get started into the details of tonight's lesson is, is that there is an all whole lot of information, a whole lot of books written about the Trinity. And I went through as many as I could in the time that is allowed and found that there's a lot of directions people can go when they teach about the Trinity. They can try and come up with trying to help you understand how one God can be three persons. Um, and they use a lot, a lot of analogies, uh, the analogy of water, ice, and steam, and other analogies, one plus one plus one equals one, or another one, one times one times one equals one. All of these analogies fall short. And the reason that they fall short is because they don't really describe what the scriptures say about God being one God in three persons. And so they kind of tend to mislead more than help us understand God's nature when it comes to his triune essence. Um, but we're going to, the second introductory remark is that the scriptures, even though, as we will discuss, the Trinity as a term is never found in the Bible is that the Bible really talks about the three persons of the Trinity in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They talk about God, Yahweh, or Jehovah. They talk about Jesus, the Son, and they talk about the Holy Spirit. And if you look at the context of the scriptures that refer to these three persons of the Trinity, they're all in the context of each of these persons being God. And so uh, an example of this, which I think is a very good example, is Matthew 28, verse 19, the Great Commission. Because Jesus met with his disciples before he ascended, and he commissioned them, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There are three distinct persons identified in the commission that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so you're going to find that as we go through tonight's lesson, there's a whole lot of scriptures that do the same thing. They talk about three persons, one God. And so hopefully the lesson tonight will have you understand what the scriptures say about the nature of God being one God, but three persons. Now, as I mentioned before, the term Trinity is not found in the scriptures. If you look at any concordance in the Bible, you will not find any biblical reference to the word Trinity, not in the Old Testament and not in the New Testament. In fact, many people say that there is no such thing as a Trinity because the word is not found in the Bible. Well, just because a word isn't found in the Bible doesn't mean that the essence of God is one God and three persons is not described as the character of God in the Bible. Um, if not in the scriptures, where did the term Trinity come from? And what does it mean? Now, although the term Trinity is not found in the scriptures, the concept of a triune God, or a God whose nature is revealed in scriptures as having three distinct persons, who are one in unity or in essence, yet three in persons, each with a distinct role, is a concept which is clearly revealed in the scriptures. 
From the time Peter gave his first sermon on the day of Pentecost, church leaders have struggled to explain the unexplainable nature of our triune Godhead. The triune essence of the three-person Godhead is essential, however, to our Christian faith. Whenever a Christian proclaims that Jesus is God, he is relying upon the doctrine of the Trinity, which affirms that there is one God, but makes a distinction between God the Father and God the Son. The paradox of what the scriptures reveal about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is that God is one in essence, yet three distinct persons who act as, a, as distinct persons at the si same time simultaneously. The Gospel of Luke, in the, in the Gospel of Luke, the scriptures reveal the three persons of the Godhead simultaneously acting as distinct persons when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. In Luke 3, verses 21 through 22, the scriptures read, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he, or Jesus, prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Jesus, in human form, is praying. The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, is descending upon Jesus. God the Father is speaking from heaven. We're talking about three distinct persons acting simultaneously. The triune or the three-in-one nature of God separates the God revealed in the scriptures from the absolute monotheism of the Muslim faith and from the polytheism of the ancient and, yes, even the modern world. If you talk to a Muslim, Allah is one God, and there's only one God. And they claim that Christianity is polytheistic because we're talking about three gods. And so Christianity is different from the monotheism, the strict monotheism of the Old Testament, which if you, as we'll study later, if you really read the Old Testament, it doesn't advocate a absolute one God concept. It, it really advocates that there are three persons, all of whom are God in essence. And it also disputes what we call polytheism. One of the things that Paul dealt with the Corinthians is how they believed in many gods. And yet Paul preached that there is one God, but there are three persons because he talked about baptizing them in this with the holy spirit and the and uh, baptizing them in the name of jesus christ and so and he also talked to the corinthians about how jesus died on the cross and raised was raised by god the father and how the holy spirit was sent by jesus to sanctify and grow the the, the uh, people that had come to christ so what we have here is that Christians proclaim that Jesus is God. At the same time, Christians proclaim that God is God and that the Holy Spirit is God. Well, is that three gods or one God? Yet those proclamations also affirm that God is one and that the nature of God as three persons is not a polytheistic faith. The scriptures which reveal God's essence as a triune God are summarized in the following three statements. If you want to call these axioms, that gets back to when you're in school that you have laws and then have axioms. Axioms are based upon strict laws. Well, the axioms of the Trinity is that God is three persons. Each person is fully God. And the third axiom is that there is only one God. The concept of the three-in-one nature of God distinguishes Christianity from the Jewish faith that believes that there is one and only one God, yet anticipates the coming of the Messiah. And depending on Orthodox Jews or other Jews, whether the Messiah comes as a man or comes as God is something that there's a difference of opinion among the Jewish people. Tonight's study of the three-person nature or essence of God is going to be broken down into um, focusing on what the Bible teaches about the Trinity, 
From tonight's lesson, we'll learn what the scriptures reveal about the triune essence of God. We'll also learn what the Trinity is not. Um, there's a lot of heresies that have been attacking this doctrine throughout the history of the church. And we're going to talk about a group, a number of those heresies. Finally, we'll look at what the Old Testament and what the New Testaments reveal about the three-person essence or nature of God from which the church derived the term Trinity. So the lesson that I want you to get tonight, or the main message which I want you to receive from this lesson is, although the term Trinity is not used in the scriptures, the scriptures in the Old Testament reveal that there is only one God, but God is also three persons who are distinct from each other. The writers of the New Testament were devout Jews who had been taught that there is only one God, but in their sermons and writings spoke of three persons of the triune God, God the Father, Jesus God the Son, and the Spirit God, the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is not a concept invented by the church, but a reality of God's essence in three distinct persons who are described as one with God, yet distinct in the roles that they manifest. So we're going to look at, the, in our study of God's three-person nature or essence, what the Trinity is. Then we're going to look at what the Trinity is not. And then we're going to talk about this, what the scriptures reveal about the Trinity. We'll have some discussion questions, and then we'll go to some conclusions. So what is the Trinity? The we're, we're going to spend a little time talking about the evolution of the church father's understanding of the Trinity. When I say the understanding of the Trinity, I'm already taking the reality that the Old Testament and New Testament talks about three persons in the Godhead. The God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are part of our scriptures, Old Testament and New. But the understanding of the church fathers that got us to the point of referring to this three-person Godhead as the Trinity was one that was consistent with the preaching of the apostles and the writings of the gospels and the early uh, fathers of the church. We're going to start with, in 70 AD, the Diadachi, which, if you remember from previous lessons, this was a writing, a commentary, or a catechism that was spread throughout the churches because there wasn't a New Testament. We didn't have the Gospels. We didn't have Paul's letter. But we had basically a summary of what the early church apostles were teaching about Christ. And so this was circulated among the church and sort of as a guideline as to what are the tenets of the Christian belief. And what they did say in the Diadachi is that how to baptize new believers. And they said baptize new believers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So in the oral, early oral tradition of the church, before the writing of the Gospels and the writing of Paul's letters and before the revelation to John, the early church clearly distinguished between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In 110 AD, Ignatius of Antioch, in his sermons and in his writings, referred to Jesus Christ as our God and acknowledged the role of the Holy Spirit at the time Jesus was conceived in human form in Mary's body. There was no question in the early church that Jesus was God. And there's no question that Mary conceived of Jesus through the act of the Holy Spirit. Again, a distinction between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In 151 AD, Justin Martyr defended the worship of Jesus Christ as the son of the one true God and second to the unchangeable and eternal God, along with the spirit of prophecy. This is bothersome when you read him when he says second to the unchangeable and eternal God, along with the spirit of prophecy. But what's important in his writings is that he identified three persons, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. In 181, Theolopolis of Antioch spoke of the parallel between the three days before the creation of the luminaries, the stars, the moon, and the sun, 
and the Trinity describing yet differentiating among God, his word, and wisdom. His words are, the three days before the luminaries were created are types of the Trinity, God, his word, and his wisdom. So again, in the early writings, Silapas was talking about a division of personages in the Godhead, God, his word, and his wisdom. In 189 AD, Arrhenius emphasized our Christian faith being founded on one God, the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. He wrote, for the church, although dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles, the oral tradition, and from their disciples, the faith in one God, the Father Almighty, and in one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became flesh for our salvation and in the Holy Spirit. Again, in the early church, 189 AD, Arrhenius is emphasizing the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. So clearly, from the very beginning of the church, they distinguished the three persons, which we now say are the trinity of the Godhead. In circa 216 AD, Tertullian, who was recognized as an early church leader, but was also trained as a lawyer, acknowledged the existence or essence of one God, but also recognized the existence or being of the Son, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Tertullian wrote, we do indeed believe that there is only one God, but we believe that under his this dispensation, or as we say, okonomia, or ocus, household, and naming, management, or ruler, or state, there is also a son of this only one God, his word, who proceeded from him, and through him all things were made, and without whom nothing was made. Now, Tertullian was a, a scholar that was educated in both Roman law and the Greek language. In Greek terminology, the Greeks distinguished between being, which was described as essence, which described the reality which never changed. And others, and these distinguished from becoming or existence, which described the reality which constantly changed. If remember when we studied John at the very beginning, he talked about logos. Well, logos was the reality that never changed. It, the, everything in the that existed changed. And so you could make the joke as a Christian that if I were using Greek terminology, I really don't believe in the existence of Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. And you'd say, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, existence means something today different than what it meant to the Greeks, because anything that existed in the Greek world changed. Well, we know that God is immutable. He doesn't change. And so God is being or his essence never changes. But God does not exist because he doesn't change. And so that was the concept that Tertullian was struggling with. Um, and when we talked about something existing, it necessarily changed. What was used in Greek argument all the time, a man standing in a stream never stood in the same, same stream of water because the water he stood in was not the same water he was standing in moments before. It was a different water that was passing by him. And he was not the same because even for a moment, he was a little bit older. So everything that existed changed and what existed wasn't God. It wasn't the logos. It wasn't the reality that never changed. Tertullian struggled with the concept of the one God who did not change, one in essence, and different and the three persona of God who played different roles, three persons in God's dispensation or household. What Tertullian observed about the Godhead is, is that there are different persona, and the different persona manifested different roles, but they are all part of God's one essence. So God was always one being, but three persona. These early Christian writers laid the groundwork for the doctrine of the Trinity, which was ratified at the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where the church leaders throughout the Roman world met 
and affirm God as being one, but which the scriptures revealed as existing in three persons. The Trinity is depicted in the following di diagram. If you go to page eight of the outline, this diagram is really, you take the whole diagram of the Trinity. You have the three personages of the Trinity, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can see that they're connected together by all being God. God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. But then you take the relationship between the three persons of the Godhead, and you say the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. So what this diagram depicts is that all three persons of the Godhead are God, but they are distinct in their persons. And so the Father is distinct from the Holy Spirit, the Son is distinct from the Holy Spirit, and they are all distinct from each other. The Nicene Creed adopted in 325 AD incorporated the triune God by affirming that Jesus was begotten, not made or created. Uh, we're going to get into the controversies that attacked the doctrine of the Trinity, but this is an important aspect because we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one, all, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance, homosusian, with the Father. So here you have the concept expressed by the early church, universally adopted in the Nicene Creed. Basically, God is one essence. He's one being that doesn't change. And he is also three persona, or three persons of the Godhead, all of whom are God, but each of them are distinct from one another. And that's basically what the Trinity is all about. Um, now, one way of identifying what something is, is by identifying what something isn't. And so we're going to talk about what the Trinity is not. And I call these the, heretic, the heretical isms. The first one is Arianism or Arius. Arius was a bishop of Alexandria, and his basic belief was Jesus is not a co-equal with God. Arius denied the full divinity of Jesus Christ. He argued that Jesus, as the Son, at one time was created by the Father, and although son, though the Son existed before the rest of creation and was superior to and far greater than the rest of creation, Jesus was not co-equal and did not originally coexist with God the Father. Therefore, Jesus was in many ways subordinate to the Father. Arius denied the co-eternal and co-equal nature between God the Father and God the Son. Arianism relies on the scriptures which describe God as the only begotten Son or as the firstborn of all creation, using those terms to describe being created or being made out of God. But if you look at the full context of these scriptures, which we already covered, is begotten means begotten in essence, but not created. Begotten in terms of, of the same nature, but not being made or created. In 325 AD, an atheist participated in the Council of Nicaea as a secretary to Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria, Egypt. He waged war against Arianism. He later became the Bishop of Alexandria in 328 AD. What's so important about an atheist is that he spent his entire life fighting Ar Arius's doctrine that Jesus was not co-equal with the Father. Um, he, fight, he, he fought against the Arian heresy. His views are incorporated in the Anathesian creed, creed, and his writings clearly affirm the Trinitarian doctrine that Jesus is co-eternal and co-equal to God, the Father, which been, has been adopted and used in the church today. It's this Council of Nicaea and what followed in terms of an atheist's 
attack against the heresy of Arius that solidified our understanding of the triune God or the Trinity. Now, the second heresy was Sabellism or modalism. Sabellius and notice um, wrote that God existed as one, but appears in three modes. Sabellism, or what we describe today as modalism, teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons, but are instead different modes or manifestations of the same God. God is one person who appears to us in three different forms at different times. The same God manifests himself or appears in three modes, much like an actor in a Greek play would wear a different mask when the same actor played different roles in the play. We all know when they go to theater, we see the smiling mask and we see the frowning mask of the Greek theater. Well, what many times one actor would play different roles. There are plays where one actor would play Satan and another he'd play God. In fact, in a play about Job, the same actor played Satan and played God. And so when he played Satan, he put a mask of Satan in front of his face. He was the same actor, but he had a different mask. And then when he played God, he put a different mask in front of him of God. And he played the role of God. Same actor, a different face. These masks, incidentally, are called persona. And so what we have here is that this argument of Sabialism or modalism took this Greek concept of God being the same person, but putting a different mask in front of him. Well, that doesn't make that the actor is a different person. The Trinity is that God is in three persona that are distinct from each other. It requires two actors, but of the same God. And so this persona created a um, heresy which had to be fought. The problem with modalism is that these modes do not operate in synchronization with each other at the same time, but operate independently. God operates as Father, and, and so he, uh, the argument is, is that, well, God the Father operated in creation, and then turn around, he operated as a son in redemption, and then he operated as the Holy Spirit in sanctification. Well, we know as Christians that the... Trinity operates in synchronization with each other. God's plan implemented by Jesus Christ and then applied by the Holy Spirit. The same God, three persona, three different roles. Then we had Nestorianism, or Nestorius argued that Christ was born as a man, not as God. Nestorius emphasized the distinction and difference between the divine and the human nature of Jesus. His doctrine denied the hypostatic union over the unity of Christ's person as fully God and fully man. If you ever hear the word hypostatic, it just means that God, Jesus is fully God and fully man. He believed that Mary was the Christokos, or the bearer of Christ as a man, denying that Mary was the Theotokos, or the bearer of Christ as God. When the Holy Spirit made Jesus inside of Mary, was Jesus God in the womb? Well, Nestorius said, no, he was a man. And he says, uh, and he said that uh, Mary bore a man and that he wasn't God. So the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD affirmed Mary's title as the Theotokos and upheld the inseparable union of Christ's divine and human nature or the hypostatic union. Then we have monophysitism. Eucasis uh, argued that Christ is a hybrid. Yes, just like the hybrid cars today, electrical and gas powered. Eucasis believed that Christ's nature was a hybrid of his divine and human natures, that the two natures were all amalgamated together and operated independently. He denied that Christ had two distinct natures, one fully divine and one fully man. He, he basically was saying, well, it's kind of a combination of the two, but they operated independently. There's times where Christ operated as a man. There's times that Christ operated as 
uh, God, and that it was like your car. Sometimes it's operating on a gas, and sometimes it's operating on electrical. Then we have the philoquism, uh, the clause that split the church. The philoque clause was added to the Nicene Creed in 589 AD. It, added, it was added in a regional church council held in Toledo, Spain, which led to the great schism between the Western and Eastern Church in 1054 AD. The original Nicene creeds adopted in 325 AD and 381 AD stated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. However, the creed adopted in 589 AD added the phrase and the so that the creed stated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, Philike. The clause asserted that the Holy Spirit derived or came from the Father and the Son, and therefore was subordinate to the Father and the Son. In other words, the Holy Spirit's not fully God. This phrase of the Nicene Creed was a statement about the nature of the Trinity and was understood to describe the eternal relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Son, denying that the Holy Spirit eternally coexisted with the Father and the Son. Now, this is when politics got into it, because the Roman Empire had split. There was the Eastern Roman Empire, the Western, and there was a struggle for dominance in the church. And so the Catholic Church, to establish its dominance and its distinction from the Eastern Church, embedded this doctrine into the Nicene Creed. And it's a heresy because it's basically saying that the Holy Spirit is not fully God. And this has been part of the Catholic Catechism since then. The next one is what we call subordinationism. Oregon, the son, argued that the son is not God's equal. Subordinationism held that the son was eternal, not created, and divine, but the son was not equal to the father in being or attributes. Jesus was God, but he was inferior to the Father, deriving his divine being or essence from the Father. So again, it subordinates Jesus to a secondary role subordinate to God the Father, not equal in person and same in essence. And then we have, of course, adopts, adoptionism. This view exposed that Jesus lived in an ordinary man until his baptism, at which time God adopted Jesus as his son and conferred on him supernatural powers. So Jesus was born as a man, and he was adopted by God in the same way that the Romans adopted his son, and he fully acquired the nature of God and the powers of God at the time of his adoption. So um, this view did not consider Jesus as eternal or that Jesus existed before he was born as a man. Jesus is considered an exalted man who God adopted and called his son. Finally, we get to social Trinitarianism versus Latin Trinitarianism. They both believe in the Trinity, but social Trinitarianists believe or emphasize in the interpersonal relationships within the Trinity. You can get into a whole lot of books that talk about these relationships between the three distinct persons of the triune God and how, these relate, how they relate to each other. Um, an example of this is that God willed for the salvation of man. Jesus implemented the plan of salvation and the Holy Spirit adopted or adapted the plan of salvation to the believer. So that's one of the inner relationships. The Latin Trinitarians focus on the one essence of God shared by the three persons of the Trinity. If you want to take a view that really uh, talks about the Trinity as we're discussing it tonight, you would adopt both both views. You adopt that God is one essence, but there are interpersonal relationships of distinct persons of the Trinity. So let's, with that now, let's go into the scriptures and what the Old Testament, New Testament says that tells us that we have a triune God, one in essence, three in persons. Let's look at the Old Testament scriptures. I'm not going to pick the first one where God says, let us, when he's talked about creation, because that could be ambiguous as to us. Is us referring to a trinity, or does it refer to something else? The context is not there. You really have to take scriptures later and apply it to the Genesis scripture to say that us 
is really talking about the Trinity. But I want to pick up with Isaiah 48, 16. In verse 16, it says, Come near to me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Well, who's speaking? Jesus is speaking. Come near to me. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that was, I was there. And now the Lord God the Father, and his Spirit have sent me. Jesus is saying that he was there at the beginning of all creation. Jesus is saying that God the Father and his Spirit have sent him, prophesizing about Jesus being sent by the Lord as a Redeemer of Israel. You take the whole context of Isaiah in chapter 48, and it's talking about redemption. Redemption through Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus that is speaking here. Now let's take another Old Testament scripture, Zechariah. If you really want to get to the Jew who thinks that Jesus isn't God, this is the scripture to read. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. The burden of the word of the Lord, all capitalized, against Israel. Thus says the Lord. Remember when we talked about the Lord being all capitalized, we're talking about Jehovah, Yahweh, the Jewish God, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of true goodness to all the surrounding peoples where they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. And that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Well, anybody that has read the book of Revelation and the end times know that we're talking about the end times. This whole prophecy is about the end times, and it's talking about the Lord redeeming Israel. But look at verse 10. I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, angry for him as one grieves for a firstborn. You can't read Zechariah and talk about Lord Yahweh and the redemption of Israel and get to verse 10 where it says, the one whom they pierced. There's only one person in the Bible that was ever pierced, and that's Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, and then in here it also talks about the Spirit. So even in Zechariah, his prophecy of the end times prophesizes the triune God. God the Father, the Redeemer of Israel, Jesus the Son, whom they pierce, and the Spirit. So what we have here in the Old Testament is a clear distinction of the three persons of the Godhead. So this passage is a prophecy, prophecy about the end time when Israel's God, Yahweh, will destroy Israel's enemies and save Judah and Jerusalem. In verses 1, 4, 5, and 7, the Lord, written all in capital letters, refers to Israel's God, Yahweh. Yet in verse 10, it refers to God, Yahweh, pouring his spirit of grace and the people of Judah and Jerusalem, looking on me whom they pierce, which refers to Christ. This scripture affirms the divinity of Christ and the triune nature of God. I think it's clear the Old Testament talked about the triune God. Let's talk about the New Testament. 
the first thing that I want to impress upon you is who wrote the books of the New Testament? Jews, the apostles, Paul. Now, what do we know about the Jews? What do we know about Paul? Every Jew was raised memorizing the first five books of the Old Testament. Every Jew was raised, indoctrinated, and catechized, if you will, with their catechism of God is one God. As Orthodox Jews, Peter, the authors of the Gospel, and Paul not only memorized the first five books of the Bible, but were fully indoctrinated in the Jewish concept that there is only one God. They knew by heart the Shema, quoted in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's the Jews that wrote the New Testament. It was the Jews that knew that there was one God. Yet the authors of the New Testament scriptures proclaim Jesus as being God. In the book of Acts, Peter, in his first sermon, quoting Joel's Old Testament prophecy about the future, proclaimed that Jesus was Yahweh, the one true God, and spoke of the triune essence of God. We're going to go through this because I think it's important to see how a Jew who was raised knowing the Shema, that there was one and only one God, talked about Jesus being God. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men will shall dream dreams. And by men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. In those days, they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Then Paul went in to refer to Psalms 1610, where David speaking about the Lord's own resurrection, and then he continued his sermon. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, his tomb is with us to with us today. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which, which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. If there isn't a statement about the Trinity in the New Testament, this is it, the definitive statement. Paul, in his first sermon on the day of Pentecost, talked about the Spirit of God and the raising of Christ at the right hand of God and that Jesus Christ is God and the Holy Spirit is God. So here we have, before the Gospels were even written, Paul's sermon recorded by Luke in the book of Acts talking about the triune God, one in essence, three in persons. Now, Peter not only speaks of God the Father, but of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, all three persons in the Trinity, fulfilling Joel's prophecy. Peter, as a Jew, knows that there is only one God, 
but boldly speaks of three distinct persons of the Godhead who are also God. Now let's go to Paul. Paul, as a devout Jew who knew the Old Testament Shema, that there was only one God, then wrote his letters to the Romans. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul is referring to Jesus as God being raised. Paul is affirming distinct persons of Jesus, both of whom are God. He is also affirming that Jesus is God. Throughout Paul's letters, throughout his epistles, Paul constantly refers to the three persons of the Godhead. Concluding his second epistle to the Corinthian church, Paul wrote, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So what we're seeing here, even before the New Testament Gospels and the epistles were written, the church affirmed a triune God, a three-person Godhead, one in essence, three in persons, three persons distinct from one another, yet all at the same time God. So what we have here is what the early church did to struggle to understand this concept of how can you have one God, but you can have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One in essence, but three in different persons that are interrelated with each other, that can simultaneously interact with each other, and yet in essence, being all being God. What did we start with? God is three persons. Each person is distinct. There is one God. That's the Trinity. And it wasn't until the Nicene Creed in 325 AD that the word Trinity and triune became part of the language of the church that described what the scriptures had already described and what the fathers in their meeting together and fighting the heresies had to deal with in terms of understanding what it meant to have God, one in essence, three in persona. So with that, now we're going to go into some discussion questions to talk about these concepts. By way of implications, applications, and conclusions, the Bible reveals that there is only one God, but it also reveals that there are three distinct persons who, as God, interact with each other and interact with mankind. The scriptures speak of the Son and the Holy Spirit as coexisting with God and as being equal to God. Although the word Trinity is not found in scripture, the Bible speaks of God as God, the Father, as God the Son, and as God the Holy Spirit. The heresies which deny the Trinity deny in one form or the other the deity of Christ as God. Right. Although we might not be able to comprehend how one God in essence can at the same time be three distinct persons who coexist and are co-equal in being with each other, it is clear that the Old Testament and New Testament identifies the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as distinct persons of the one and only God. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's see. 